Hi everyone. Okay, thorny issue of measurement in quantum mechanics. We're going to have to forego some of the philosophical discussion because this particular thorny issue has been dragging on for well, over a century now, still not resolved. Indeed, we don't even really understand exactly what the wave function is telling us, as you know. But as you've seen, we can do some incredibly sophisticated and elegant calculations that perhaps even more important than the elegance, no, definitely more important than the elegance and the sophistication of the calculations, is that we can predict experimental results, we can ex predict aspects of the real world with an incredible degree of precision. But ultimately, in terms of what's happening with the measurement process, that remains unresolved. I'm going to cover this, as I've been covering for over the last couple of videos, in the context of what's really, I guess, the best described as the traditional approach to quantum mechanics, the Copenhagen interpretation, where we talk about the wave function being collapsed, that when we make a measurement, we collapse the wave function into an eigenstate of that particular operator that's given us an observable, give us an eigenvalue associated with the, the eigenfunctions of the operator, and we collapse from the probability density down to a particular result. Now, that doesn't mean that we're there for all time. If you happen to collapse into a stationary state, so if it's a stationary state of the Hamiltonian, then that's stationary. But uh, in other cases, it's going to evolve. So we can make a position measurement. It doesn't stay there for all time because that's not a st um, that delta function that I discussed is not a stationary state, and it will evolve in time according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Or we can make a measurement of momentum, and it will um, evolve in time as well because we're not in a stationary state. Of the, of the operator. So, we're in an eigenstate, let me clarify that, we're in an eigenstate of the operator, but not all eigenstates are stationary states. Eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are stationary states, that doesn't mean every single state is stationary states. Indeed, as we saw, even with just the Hamiltonian, if we're just considering the Hamiltonian, we can have mixtures of eigenstates and they will evolve in time. So only pure eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are stationary, i.e. don't evolve in time. So, there's a whole range of different interpretations with regard to the measurement problem. And it's a thorny problem because we have, as I mentioned before, we have the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Everything's moving along nicely, linearly, deterministically. We make a measurement, bang, and we get this abrupt change in the system. It's where we collapse the wave function, and then it starts to evolve again. But that process, that measurement, that collapse, is something which is debated very, very heavily. Some have said, well, actually, we don't even have to think about collapse if we postulate many worlds. So many worlds interpretation, I've pointed to videos on that before. I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of time for the many worlds interpretation, and I don't have a lot of time for some individuals' um, claims that, well, the many worlds interpretation is just the only way you can go in terms of quantum mechanics, that everything leads you that way. There's no empirical evidence for it at all. And indeed, those other universes de would decohere, decouple from this one very, very rapidly indeed. So the chances of getting empirical evidence for the, the many worlds interpretation are slim, to put it mildly. A whole host of other interpretations. But what we need to do is to have something that works. So in that sense, I'm, although I said right at the start I was kind of going to try and avoid shut up and calculate, when it comes to this measurement problem, and just how we get values from measurements. We're gonna look at the mathematical machinery. I am going to get beyond shut up and calculate in the sense that as with the previous videos, what I'm gonna try and do is, is connect to other areas of physics. You know, I've been dropping stones in the pond talking about, you know, base strings and superpositions of waves, etc. What I don't like is this idea that quantum is this incredibly, you know, radically different thing that doesn't connect with anything else. First of all, there's something called the correspondence principle, which means that in the right limit, our qu quantum results have to be our classical results. But moreover, we've seen, for example, in terms of Fourier uh, representations, which are so core to everything we've done thus far, those aren't just a purely quantum thing. They're right across all of science and right across the whole of the, the world around us. Okay, that was a long introduction to, to this, but I, I had to put those provisos in place before I start. So, we're gonna talk about measurement. What happens with measurement, just to hammer it home one last time. We have an operator, 
that operate or certain eigenfunctions associated with it. So in the last video, it's Hermitian. That means the eigenvalues associated with that operator are real valued, as they should be, because we're making a measurement in the real world. So when we apply that operator, we collapse the state of the system into an eigenstate, into an eigenfunction of that operator. And so I talked about the position measurement last time, where our eigenstates are delta functions. So we make a position measurement, we collapse it into that state, immediately after, and I keep stressing this immediately, it's immediately, immediately after, if you look at that particle, it's, it's at that position. We found it at that position. It will evolve though. The wave function will evolve again according to the Schrodinger equation, uh, time dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, bleh, equation, unless we're in a stationary state. So, that's what happens when we make a measurement. But the question then is what if we do two measurements one after each other? So, we collapse it into an eigenstate of that particular um, operator associated with that particular op uh, observable, let's say, position. So if we make a measurement again, it's in that eigenstate. So when you make that measurement, if we make a measurement of position again, we're going to get, assuming that the system hasn't evolved, we're going to get the, um, i.e. we do the measurement quickly, enough immediately afterwards. It's in that eigenstate. When we measure it again, it's going to be in that eigenstate and we'll get that value again. But what happens if we make a measurement of position and then we make a measurement of momentum? So if we're talking about the position representation of the wave function, our position eigenfunctions are most definitely not the same as our momentum eigenfunctions, delta functions versus plane waves. So when we, if we make a measurement of momentum and we put the system in a state of an eigenfunction of the momentum operator, that's not going to be the same state. And so we then go back to make our position measurement. So measure position measurement, collapse the system into an eigenstate of the position operator. Make a momentum measurement, collapse the system into an eigenstate, eigenfunction of the momentum operator. So when we go back to make a position measurement, we're not going to get the same value as the first time around because the eigenfunction associated with the momentum operator is not the same as the eigenfunction associated with the position operator. Only in the case where the operators share, have a common set of eigenfunctions. So that if you collapse it into the eigenstate for one operator, it's the same as the eigenstate, same as one of the eigenstates for the other operator. Only in that particular case are we going to be, have what are called compatible measurements. So we can think of compatible observables in two ways. One, as I said, make a measurement, say it, Let's take position again, then we make a measurement of momentum, and then we make a position, measurement of position again. Momentum and um, position are not compatible observables because we don't have um, eigenfunctions in common. The other way of thinking about it is that we can make for compatible observables, so observables that do have, or associated with operators that have um, common sets of eigenfunctions, we can make measurements of those two quantities simultaneously. It's another way of thinking about it. Now, there's a really neat and quite compact mathematical um, algebra. How do we call it? Mathematical formalism is too strong a word. It's just a neat, elegant, compact um, notation called um, commutator algebra, where in exactly the same sense as just with straight multiplication, multiplication is commutative in that five by Sorry, 6 by 7 is 42, is the same as 7 by 6. It doesn't matter the order in which we do it. However, when it comes to quantum mechanics, for the reasons I've just said, it very, very much depends, in many cases, in the, the order in which we apply the operators. So, if we've got compatible observables, then we say that the operators commute because it doesn't matter what order we apply them in. Because they've got, they've got common eigenfunctions, therefore if we collapse one into an eigenfunction of one operator, it's in an eigenfunction of the other operator. However, for position and momentum, for example, those operators do not commute. And we can work out very straightforwardly, mathematically, whether operators commute or not by I'm calculating something called the commutator and if it's non-zero then they don't commute if it's zero then they do commute okay few lines on the board 
to show you how commutators work. I'll show you one example. There were two other examples in the notes. And then you'll also be asked to do some commutation relations in the worksheets just to hammer this home. Okay, let's take a general operator. I will apply this to a specific case in a second. Um, operating on a wave function. I'm going to be careful here and I'm going to denote that with an A and N like that. It's just a different index. Don't, don't get too concerned. Uh, we need it there for the bookkeeping as you'll see in a second. But this is just a standard eigenvalue equation. Operator, operating an eigenfunction returns eigenvalue times eigenfunction. Let's write something similar for an operator B. Hat. You get the idea. Operator, eigenfunction, eigenvalue, eigenfunction. Right, but now let's assume that we've got um, an eigenfunction that's an eigenfunction of both operators. So, let me just space this out a little bit. I'm just going to... So let's say... So that will operate on that will return that eigenvalue. But this is um, this eigenfunction is an eigenfunction of both operators. So let's do that as well here. Don't get confused by the notation, and I'll try not to get confused. So it's that eigenvalue in this case returning the same eigenfunction. Okay, so just this is an eigenfunction and the reason I've used that indexing is to show that it's an eigenfunction of both operators. Okay, what we're going to do now, because remember what we're interested in here is what happens when we apply one operator and then, sorry, hit the microphone. Remember what we're interested in here is what happens when we apply one operator then another operator. So let's apply that operator. So that's going to return that eigenvalue. And let's apply this operator. So that's going to return that eigenvalue. Maybe you can guess what the next step's going to be. So the next step is going to be, we're going to subtract this from this. So what we have, minus operator. Operating on this wave function which is an eigenfunction of both operators. That, so that the n by bm, that function is the same, that function is the same, all of ever, that cycles to zero. So, what we have is something called the commutator. This is why it's called a commutator. We've got that operation or that operator followed by that one and then the, the reverse. And if they share, if the operators share common eigenfunctions, then this would be zero. This commutator would be this thing called, we call a commutator, which we also write in a much more straightforward. Sometimes it's written even without the hats. That's our commutator. And because it works for general functions, we can even drop the, the wave function on that side. And we basically, if that quantity, which is defined by this, one operator uh, operating on the other minus the other way around, if that's zero, then we say that the operators commute and we have compatible observables. So it doesn't matter which order in which we make the measurements. Moreover, we can make measurements of those two quantities associated with the, the um, operators, those observables. We can make those simultaneously for the reasons I said right at the start. So it's a very powerful, not hopefully too mathematically complicated idea very elegant idea and this we can in fact couch quantum mechanics largely just in terms of commut commutators we're not going to do that but it's certainly a very compact and elegant way of of looking at the measurement problem in the notes i worked through three examples with three different um, pairs of operators let's just do the position operator and the momentum operator in the x direction. Okay, I need to be very clear because we're going to see that this and this don't commute. However, the position operator in one direction does commute. 
with the momentum operator in, for example, the y direction or the z direction. We'll come back to that later on. We'll look at it again when we get into matrix mechanics later on towards the end of the module. We'll see that in bracket notation, all that lovely stuff. But um, just this is why I'm being very careful to put the x in here. We're going to see in terms of our one dimensional world where we've only got the x direction and plus and minus x directions. Um, then this, this is fine, but I put that in to be absolutely clear that we're just talking about the x um uh, the momentum operator in the x-direction. So what we're going to do? Well, we're going to apply this to our wave function. What does that mean? So what we're going to do is remember it's one operator followed by the other operator um, minus the other way around acting on psi. And we're, we're obviously reading this from left to right. So what we have is what's the, um, the position operator? Well, that's just x x, this will be minus i h star d, d, d x, minus, just to put brackets around it for clarity, and we have to be careful with negative signs here, minus i h bar d, d, x, x, and let's put big brackets around that, all operating on psi. So we be careful in terms of how we one thing that's very easy to do, I do it a lot, is drop minus signs. Be careful with the minus signs. So I'll just move things up the board to make things a little bit clearer. So let's just be clear what we're doing here. So we've got our commutator, which is basically first operator acting on the second operator minus the second operator acting on the first operator uh, operating on our, our wave function. So our first operator is the, met, is the position operator. So that's acting on our momentum operator, which is in turn acting on our wave function, minus our momentum operator acting on our position operator acting on our wave function. Just got to be careful with the order in which we do things and, as I said, the negative signs. Right, so what we have is, well, this one's okay in the sense that we can just multiply it out. So let's i hit for x d psi dx. Here we've got a product. So we need to be careful in terms of how we do a differentiation. So minus i h bar, first by, the, first by the derivative of the second plus the second by the derivative of the first. So we've got x by d psi dx plus second by the derivative of the first will just be one times that gives us that. So what we have minus i h bar x by d psi dx plus i h bar, that's good, x by d psi dx plus i h bar minus minus this psi. Those go and so what we have so the commutator is not zero so these don't commute which means that it, it very much depends on which order we make the measurements we can't make simultaneous measurements because they don't share common eigenfunctions when we make a measurement of position, we put the system in an eigenstate, which is a delta function of the position operator, which is not the same as an eigenfunction of the momentum operator. So when we come along and apply our momentum, sorry, hit the microphone again. When we come along and apply our momentum operator, we kick it into another eigenstate, which isn't an eigenstate of the position operator. So when we come back to make a measurement of position, we've shifted the eigenstate and we'll get a different measurement for position. So we don't have compatible observables. Two other examples in the notes, work your way through them. It's the same logic. You just need to be careful in terms of the order in which you apply the operators and don't drop minus signs. And um, also there'll be a number of these on worksheet seven for you to get some practice with. Okay, finally, for now, with regard to measurement, you might be thinking, um, does this relate to the uncertainty principle? You'd think it must relate to the uncertainty principle in some way, and indeed it does, and in a very, very fundamental way. So, 
first of all, evidence, compatible evidence, consistent, in that I said, if we um, make a measurement and the system is in an eigenstate of the operator um, associated with that particular observable, then we measure that eigenvalue with complete certainty. So that means if we've got compatible observables and we're always you know, in an eigenstate of those operators, we effectively get um, zero uncertainty in, with regard to the combination of our measurements. We're always in an eigenstate of the one or the other of the operators and they share those eigenstates. However, we know for position and momentum that there's um, an uncertainty relation re relating those two. Now, we've seen that that stems ultimately from Fourier transforms, and we can look at the width of the um, probability density, use the width of the, 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 the probability density curve in terms of the position representation and also the probability density curve in terms of the momentum representation. Those are reciprocally related, and from that we can um, deduce the, the, the uncertainty principle. That's a very powerful way of doing it. However, we can also do it with commutator. By considering commutators, as you might expect, because this is all about measurements and combinations of measurements. However, we need to use something called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Apologies for my, my pronunciation. Which is a bit of mathematics which makes a lot more sense, I would say at least, in the context of linear algebra and in the context of matrix mechanics. So I'm going to just postpone that discussion of that for a little bit later on. But for now, just to um, set your mind at ease if you were thinking about the uncertainty principle and all those things. That's our commutator. Let me just shift. So with two observables, A and B, and they have root mean square um, uncertainties in the sense that you've done in the f undergraduate labs. And if you haven't done the undergraduate labs that you've done in quantitative physics last year, and if you've done neither quantitative physics last year or the undergraduate labs, get in touch and I'll point you in the right direction in terms of these types of statistical quantities. You've pretty much covered them somewhere else in the course thus far as well. Um, so this is the root mean square deviation from the mean, root mean square deviation from the mean. That is going to be somewhat remarkably, and this looks like magic just quoted like this. And this is going to be the expectation value of the commutator for A and B. And this is the absolute, this is the absolute value of the modulus of that. So what we have for position and momentum will be that delta x by delta px is greater than or equal to a half. What's the, well, the expectation value of that is that, and the modulus of that, the absolute value of that is h bar. Okay, that looks like magic. I know it looks like magic. Bear with me for a few, oh, I don't know when we'll get to it, a couple of weeks down the line, and we'll approach this from the, 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 the context of linear algebra with a Cauchy Swartz. For those of you who want to look it up, and it's mentioned in the notes anyway is this makes much more sense in the context of linear algebra and much more sense in the context of when we think about this um, we move to thinking of wave functions and eigenfunctions in terms of vectors don't let that worry you we'll, we'll go through that gently as well and in fact in fact you've already been for any of the coding you've done you've already been thinking of wave functions in terms of vectors as lists of numbers so it's not so scary um, okay so that's for now, we're going to sort of move on from this. Uh, next video, I'm just going to list out the postulates and the principles, of which there are about five now, not about, there are five, just so we can have a, it's the 20th video, I believe, if I've been counting correctly. So that will give us a little bit of a, um, another stop and pause, taking stock type moment. And then after that, we're going to get back to those Gaussian wave packets. I know you've been waiting on the edge of your seat to get back to those Gaussian wave packets. Um, but we're going to consider those Gaussian wave packets. We're going to consider scattering of those Gaussian wave packets of different potentials. And in particular, we're going to look at tunneling. And once we start looking at tunneling, we're going to go downstairs, two floors into the research lab. And I'm going to show you tunneling in action using a scanning tunneling microscope. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time in the next few videos 
thinking about the experimental realizations of what we've been looking at. The last few videos and chapter four of the notes are pretty mathematically heavy and pretty theoretical. We're going to put that into practice and we're going to look at state of the art um, quantum systems probed using scanning tunneling microscopy. And with STM, scanning tunneling microscopy, really revolutionized our ability to probe the quantum world. Right. So next video is a bit of a, a recap and we'll li I'll list out the postulates and the principles and then we'll start putting this in the context of experimental measurements. See you later. Bye.